two. Good evening and welcome to the Wednesday, May 11th Scarborough Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, the meeting will now come to order. This is a public proceeding and unless the board specifically votes to go into executive session, the public has the right to hear everything that is being said and to view all of the exhibits that are presented. Uh, please notify the chairperson, which is me, if you can't see or hear the proceedings that are going on here. The board tonight will work from a prepared agenda as follows. Um, we'll go through the Pledge of Allegiance, the roll call, approval of our minutes, approval of our draft written decision from last month. We have two appeals on the agenda for this evening, 2725 and 2726. We will have zoning board comments and then we will adjourn. So that being said, let's go ahead and start with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Mr. Longstaff, may we have roll call, please? Certainly. Mr. Karen? Here. Mr. Siltwin? Here. Mr. Hebert? Here. Mr. Bork? Here. Ms. Stevenson? Here. Mr. Freilinger? <clears throat> Ms. Snow? Cool. Thank you. First up, we're gonna, next up, we're going to look at the approval of our minutes from our last month's meeting. That's on April 13th. Has everyone had a chance to review and look over the minutes? Uh, seeing uh, after this, does anyone have any comments or edits that they would like to make? I'll take a motion to approve. Mr. Bork? So moved. And is there a second? I'll second. Mr. Karen seconds. All those in favor? Mr. Karen? Aye. Mr. Silkman? Aye. Uh, Mr. Bork? Aye. Ms. Stevenson? Aye. Excellent. Then passes. The mints are approved from last month. And note for the record, Mr. Silkman and Ms. Stevenson are voting members this evening. Next up, we have our approval of our draft written decision for appeal heard at the April 13th meeting. This is appeal number 2724. Has everyone had a chance to go through, review the findings of fact from our last meeting? And are there any comments, edits, suggestions? Excellent, seeing none. Um, is there a motion on the floor to approve the draft funding, Mr. Bork? So moved. Is there a second? Aye, second. There's a second, and all those in favor, Mr. Karen? Aye. Mr. Silkman? Yes. Mr. Bork? Aye. And Ms. Stevenson? Aye. And I vote aye as well. This is the appeal of 2724. Mr. Longstaff. Okay, first up is our appeal. The first appeal is number 2725. This is a miscellaneous appeal by Anthony Shelton from 8 Hagus Parkway, Assessor's Map U038, lot number seven. Um, this is a uh, miscellaneous appeal with a planning board advisory opinion uh, to the ZBA. Um, is there someone here representing? Why don't you come on up to the podium? State your name, um, who you are for the record. Anthony Shelton. Excellent. Thank you. Um, kicking us off, why don't you tell us why you're here, Mr. Shelton? Yeah, so I'd like to add a garage to the back of my property and then most likely take down the uh, shed that's there now. That's the... It's that building right behind where the garage would be located. Um, I do have a question about that. If I did take it down, could I, if I didn't have enough space in my garage, could I put up a shed or would that, would that mean another appeal or how that would work? Mr. Longstaff? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, you may want to, you may want to retain the shed, then you could replace the shed. Mm -hmm. With another shed, that wouldn't be an expansion of the use because you already have a shed. Mm -hmm. Remove the shed, build the garage, and then want another shed. You'd, you'd be back here again. Which, okay. Yeah. So if I take it right down and put another shed up in its place, then I'm good. Uh, if you, yeah, if you remain, yeah, you can replace it, but but you can't remove it and then come back a year later. Right. It has to be all in sort of one yeah. one action, and yes. it can't it can't be larger than the existing footprint that is there. Yes, absolutely. Okay, great, great. Go on. Um. So. Yeah, that's basically my appeal is to be able to put a garage behind 
there on my property. I did have the um, lot expanded. So that's already, you can see the survey there where it was expanded. So it's at least 15. It's actually more than 25 feet from each line um, of the property. Sorry, I'm looking for, uh, this is just a straight up and down vote. Is that correct, Mr. Uh, Lyons? Okay. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> yes, Mr. Chair, um, for the expansion of a nonconforming use, a miscellaneous appeal, um, it requires that we review the um, special exception criteria. Mm -hmm. So those are, the, those are the criteria that we need to be reviewing. Um, and gotcha. I, did, Thank you. I did put before you a draft um, findings uh, so that you can read off, off that as far as what the uh, criteria is. Great. Thank you. Now, I've misplaced my sheet right in front of me. So what I'm going to do right now, Mr. Shelton, is going to go through each of the criteria, mm -hmm. uh, A through I. And so what you can do is just read your answers that you've provided us. Just read that right into the microphone so that we can have an audio recording of it for the record. Mm -hmm. Sure. So the first one, letter A. The proposed use will not create unsanitary or unhealthful conditions by reason of sewage disposal, emissions to the air or water, or other aspects of its design or operation. Uh, the proposed one-car garage is not expected to create unhealthful conditions by any reason and is designed by a reputable company, the Home Depot. Great. Uh, the proposed... The proposed use will not create unsafe vehicular or pedestrian traffic conditions when added to existing um, <clears throat> when added to existing and foreseeable traffic in its vicinity. The one car garage will replace the location where I currently park my vehicle so is not expected to have any effect on pedestrian or vehicle vehicular traffic on Hagus Parkway. Great. Uh, the proposed use will not create public safety problems, which would be substantially different from those created by existing uses in the neighborhood or require, require a substantially greater degree of municipal fire or police protection than existing uses in the neighborhood. The residential use of the garage for my personal autos and storage is not expected to create any public safety concerns greater than other uses in the neighborhood. Great. The proposed use will not result in sedimentation or erosion or have an adverse effect on water supplies. Yeah, and this one I wasn't sure exactly what I was getting at, but I, I, this is what I wrote. Uh, the laying of the foundation for the garage is not expected to affect our property's water line since the water line comes in at the front of the house and the garage will be located behind the back of the house. The use of the garage is not expected to result in sedimentation or erosion since the sewer system is at the front of the property and the garage is at the rear. Yep, that's a good answer, thank you. Okay. Uh, the proposed use will be compatible with existing uses in the neighborhood with respect to physical size, visual impact, intensity of use, proximity to other structures, and density of development. The one-car garage will be compatible with my neighbor's two-car garage at 12 Hagus Parkway. Though smaller in size than my neighbor's garage, it is not expected to have any visual impact since most of it will be behind my house at the furthest point from the road on the property. Great. Thank you. Uh, letter F. If located in the shoreland zone, Mr. Longstaff can confirm that this is not located in the shoreland zone? Yes, I can. It's not in the shoreland zone. Great. We can skip that one. Okay. Uh, G, the applicant has sufficient right, title, or interest in the site of the proposed use to be able to be carry to, to be able to carry out the proposed use. Excuse me. Yes, I'm the property owner. I've had the copies there of the deed. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, the applicant has the technical and financial ability to meet the standards of this section and to comply with any conditions imposed by the Board of Appeals pursuant to subsection five of this section. Yes, I paid the $250 fee for the application. I also expect to be able to pay the additional property taxes due to the increase in property value. Great. I don't know if there's anything else, but... No, no, no need. It's a pretty, pretty straightforward, simple answer. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, letter I, the proposed use will be compatible with existing uses in the neighborhood with respect to the generation of noise and hours of operation. The garage will only generate a little noise from the electric garage door opener, uh, but it's not expected to be noticeable to anyone outside my property. Is expected to be compatible with existing uses in the neighborhood. Great. Thank you very much. 
Does the board have any questions for the applicant? It's Mr. Bork. Yes, uh, Mr. Shelton, on point D, which is regarding uh, <clears throat> sedimentation and erosion, uh, this uh, will create some impervious uh, surface, the addition of impervious surface. Uh, what are you doing, if anything, in order to uh, control water runoff? Um, so it, I've talked to the person that's going to lay the foundation and do the digging. They are going to slant it slightly toward the front of the garage so that any uh, any water that would hit the side walls, for example, of, uh, or the roof and then come down, if it doesn't go into the, um, I'm planning on also putting a, uh, oh, what's it called? I can't think of it right now. Uh, not downspout, but the uh, gutters. gutters, thank you. Um, I'm planning on putting that in as well. Um, but any water that hits the side and goes down, it would, uh, should go down toward the front because it's going to gradually be uh, graded toward the front. Okay, and, and does the, the front have landscaping in place, you know, grass, uh, plants, whatever, to absorb the wet water runoff? No, if we go back to the, uh, yeah, right here. So there is a driveway there, so it's going to be, the, the garage is behind the house there, and then there's a driveway. Part of it is going to be grass, um, but I'm planning on expanding, that's the next phase, uh, to expand more uh, blacktop when I redo the blacktop on there. Uh, so, but what it would do is it would, it would run down there and then have quite a bit of space where it would also you know, hit grass and stuff before it would go down to any drains. Thank you. All right. Any other questions from the board? Great. Are you going to run water out to the shed, this garage? No, electricity, but not water. Great. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Do we receive any public comment, Mr. Staff, Long Staff? Uh, we received no public comment, no written comments. I received no phone calls. Cool. Thank you. Uh, if there's anyone from the, well, up on the public floor, here, floor for anybody who'd like to speak on this, uh, seeing no one would like to speak, I'll close the public floor. And uh, you can have a seat, Mr. Shelton. We'll uh, ask you up for any questions if we have them. We'll now deliber deliberate separately as a board. <clears throat> Before I go through the questions, uh, is there anything anyone likes to chime in? Seems pretty straightforward. This zone in, around Hagus um, is zoned really uh, unfortunate for folks who have a residential home in there. So a lot, we'll see a lot of these come up uh, just because of the zoning of that space. And folks who already live there have to come before us for sort of any anything that they have to do there. So it seems pretty pretty minor, but we have to go through the steps. I guess seeing them, we'll go right into it then. We'll start with letter A. The proposed use will not create unsanitary or unhealthful conditions by reason of sewage, disposal, emissions to the air or water, or other aspects of its design or operation. And I'll start down here, Mr. Karen. Uh, as presented this evening, I don't see any uh, areas where the, the shed itself, the garage, would um, contribute to additional admis uh, emissions uh, to the air or water. Uh, there was some mention of rainwater runoff from the roof, uh, but as mentioned, uh, grading of the uh, foundation uh, will, will direct the water to the existing paved surfaces. Thank you. Mr. Silkman? Okay. Mr. Bork? Uh, I have nothing to add. Ms. Stevenson? I have nothing to add. Okay. I'll note that um, there isn't going to be any water added to the shed here, so there really isn't going to be any uh, kind of sewage disposal or water disposal from, from, the, um, from this building. And it's going to be used for like any other standard storage facility, whether for a shed or vehicle storage. Mr. Chair, yes, I would Mr. also Chair. point out that, that a good portion of the garage footprint is already on impervious surface. Um, as shown on the survey plan, so you can see where the garage was located. Yeah, if you go to the survey plan, it's located primarily right there. Yep, that so, sort of comes to your question earlier, your comment earlier, Mr. Bork, about impervious service. So thank you for pointing that out, Mr. Longstaff. <clears throat> All those in favor of uh, criteria A being met, Mr. Uh, Karen? Aye. Mr. Silkman? Yes. Mr. Bork? Aye. Ms. Stevenson? Aye. And I vote aye as well. Letter B. 
The proposed use will not create unsafe vehicular or pedestrian traffic conditions when added to the existing and foreseeable traffic in its vicinity. Mr. Karen. Uh, the placement of the garage is to the rear of the existing building, um, away from the street. I don't see how it could uh, negatively impact any vehicular traffic other than normal um, residential um, parking. Great. Mr. Silkman? Uh, Mr. Bork? Nothing to add. Ms. Stevenson? Nothing to add. Great. Yeah, this is, this is a, it's one vehicle that's there that's being used. There's nothing really being added to the property, so you're not going to you're not going to be creating any kind of uh, unsafe uh, vehicular activity that's are that's not already present. Uh, that being said, all those in favor, Mr. Karen, aye. Mr. Silkman, yes. Mr. Bork, aye. Ms. Stevenson, aye. And I vote aye as well. Letter C. The proposed use will not create public safety problems, which would be substantially different from those created by existing uses in the neighborhood or require a substantially greater degree of municipal fire or police protection than existing uses in the neighborhood. Mr. Karen. This is a standard garage, um, similar to others in the area, as noted. Um, I think it was 12 uh, Hagen <coughs> Parkway as a two-car garage, uh, so similar to existing uses in the neighborhood. Uh, intended for storage and vehicular parking, uh, so nothing that would be substantially greater uh, for fire or police protection. It was noted that there's no plumbing, so just electricity, um, and it is detached from the residence, uh, so there will be a separation for any fire um, concerns about fire protection. Great. Mr. Silkman? Okay. Mr. Bork? Nothing to add. Uh, Ms. Stevenson? I have nothing to add. Great. No, I, I don't. I think you uh, covered it all, Mr. Karen. Thank you. All those in favor of letter C being met, Mr. Karen? Aye. Mr. Silkman? Yes. Ms. Bor uh, Mr. Bork? Aye. Ms. Stevenson? Aye. And I vote aye as well. Letter D, the proposed use will not result in sedimentation or erosion or have an adverse effect on water supplies. Um, I'm going to start down here, Ms. Sil uh, Ms. Stevenson. <laughs> um, as stated in the application, um, it's uh, already on a f uh, blacktop, looks like, that's going to be built over. So that will be minimal change in erosion or and also give um, adequate drainage um, if he adds the gutters to the top of it. Um, and the property line is, the water line is in the front, so it um, doesn't seem to be have any effect on... Um, the water line that's existing going to the house. Excellent. Thank you. Mr. Bork. Nothing to add. Mr. Silkman. Nothing to add. Mr. Karen. Uh, agreed. Uh, as mentioned, the uh, gutters and downspouts will help direct any rainwater runoff from roof. Um, so no concerns. Yep. I'll also note for the record as well that the applicant has noted that consideration has been given to the design and layout of the, of the garage. Uh, to address water runoff. All those in favor of letter D being met? Ms. Stevenson? Aye. Mr. Bork? Aye. Mr. Silkman? Yes. Mr. Karen? Aye. And I vote aye as well. Letter E, the proposed use will be compatible and with existing uses in the neighborhood with respect to physical size, visual impact, intensity of use, proximity to other structures, and density of development. Ms. Stevenson? Uh, as stated in the application, the one car garage will be um, aesthetically similar to the others in the neighborhood um, with his neighbor having a two car garage and um, with respect to physical size and visual impact, it should not be much different than what is already existing. Excellent. Thank you. Mr. Bork? Nothing to add. Mr. Silkman? Mr. Karen? Uh, as mentioned this evening, it is placed to the rear of the, the site, uh, away from the street. Um, so sight lines from the street are blocked from the residence. Um, so uh, nothing further to add. Thank you, Mr. Karen. I'll, I'll mention um, sight lines is important when we're talking about visual, physical size, visual impact. Um, and it's a garage that's typical for a building like this for a residential dwelling. Um, there is uh, other residence, residences in that area that also have garages and some larger garages than this one. So I don't see an issue 
with this. All those in favor of letter E being met. Ms. Stevenson? Aye. Mr. Bork? Aye. Mr. Silkman? Yes. Mr. Karen? Aye. And I vote aye as well. Uh, if located in a shoreland zone, Mr. Longstaff has confirmed that this is not in the shoreland zone, so we'll just go do up and down vote on this one. Ms. Stevenson? Aye. Mr. Uh, Bork? Aye. Mr. Silkman? Yes. Mr. Karen? Aye. And I vote aye as well. Uh, letter G, this applicant has sufficient right, title, or interest in the site of the proposed use to be able to carry out the proposed use. Ms. Stevenson? Uh, he has shown that he is the property owner and has sufficient right to um, propose this garage. Excellent. Mr. Bork? Nothing to add. Mr. Silkman? Agreed, yes. Mr. Karen? Agreed. Uh, included with the application, there's uh, the additional information relevant for this. Agreed. The applicant has provided the deed and the real estate closing documents. Uh, all those in favor of letter G being met, Ms. Stevenson? Aye. Mr. Bork? Aye. Mr. Silkman? Yes. Mr. Carrot? Aye. Excellent. That's unanimous. Uh, letter H, the applicant has the technical and financial ability to meet the standards of this section and to comply with any conditions imposed by the Board of Appeals pursuant to subsection 5 of this section. Ms. Stevenson? Uh, yeah, he has agreed to already pay the application fee and is expecting um, in the future with the addition to this garage that the property taxes may increase um, because the uh, property value will um, go up in value. So he um, is prepared to take on that financial responsibility as well. Cool. Thank you. Mr. Bork? Agreed. Mr. Silkman? Agreed. Uh, Mr. Karen? Agreed. Uh, it was mentioned that the applicant has been working with um, others, uh, such as those who help design the foundation, uh, so seeking additional technical resources. Uh, so some, uh, no concerns here. Yep. She so has the technical ability to meet these uh, any sort of financial requirements. Uh, that being s said, all those in favor of letter H, criteria letter H being met, Ms. Stevenson? Aye. Mr. Bork? Aye. Mr. Silkman? Yes. And Mr. Karen? Aye. It's unanimous. And last, uh, letter I, the proposed use will be compatible with existing uses in the neighborhood with respect to generation of noise and hours of operation. Mr. Karen. Um, being a garage at the rear of the facility, uh, residence, uh, it would be anticipated that it would be used for storage, as mentioned this evening. Um, no additional noise uh, generation beyond, as mentioned, the garage opener, uh, which from this uh, location on the site should be negligible to any of the butters. Um, typical sounds um, and the hours of operation, uh, those can vary based on how uh, one uses their property and their garage, but um, for storage, it should not be a, a major concern. Thank you. Mr. Silkman? Agreed. Mr. Bork? Agreed. Ms. Stevenson? Agreed. Excellent. I agree with now. It's a residential accessory building that is n n not untypical for many other building that has one. That's really not a word. Sorry about that. All those in favor of criteria I being met? Mr. Karen? Aye. Mr. Silkman? Yes. Mr. Bork? Aye. Ms. Stevenson? Aye. I vote aye as well. Um, at this time, I'll entertain a motion to approve appeal number 2725 as presented. Mr. Silkman so moves. Second. Mr. Bork seconds. Uh, all those in favor? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Longstaff. Any discussion before we go further with the vote? Any comments? Great. Um, Mr. Karen, your vote? I vote aye. Mr. Silkman? Aye. Mr. Bork? Aye. And Ms. Ms. Stevenson? Aye. And I vote aye as well. The appeal uh, application passes. Congratulations. Okay. All we need is a building permit now. <laughs> So you're all set. Don't feel like you need to stay for the entirety of the rest of the meeting unless you would like to. <laughs> just, just apply for a building permit for your garage. Okay. Yeah. You want to talk to this guy? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next up we have appeal number 2726. This is a variance appeal by Northeast Civil Solutions on behalf of Roger Hillis and Lisa Olson, 14 Sakurapa Lane, Assessor's Map U017, lot 44. Please introduce yourself and uh, tell us who you are and why we're here. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Jim Fisher with Northeast Civil. 
uh, here with Mr. Hillis uh, this evening. He is the uh, applicant, uh, the appellant, and uh, the owner of the property. We are here, um, have the, uh, the privilege of uh, working with Mr. Hillis regarding a uh, property that he owns at uh, Sakarapa Lane. This is down in the Prout's Neck area of town. Uh, it is on one of the smallest lots uh, probably in the municipality completely. Uh, and normally uh, what he would like to be able to do is uh, reconstruct, raise the existing structure and, and reconstruct a new structure uh, on this lot that would bring it into considerably greater compliance all the way around uh, from what's there right now. Essentially, this would be uh, eligible for a uh, practical difficulty variance, um, but it is in a uh, flood zone. So when that's the case, if something is in the shoreland zone or a flood zone, it automatically goes to a hardship variance. Um, which is why you have that criteria before you. It is not in a shoreland zone. It is uh, not in an erosion hazard area zone. It's not in a dune. It's not burdened by any easements. It is in the flood zone. Uh, and what we have is an exceptionally small lot, 50 by 74, that um, is, again, one of the smaller lots in town. The actual building lot, based on today's standards, is about uh, 380 feet. That's essentially the size of a good-sized shed. Other than that, um, there's no way that uh, this property and most of the other properties in that particular area would be able to meet current zoning as far as the setbacks are concerned. What we have right now is a house that has literally been built uh, or was built as a cottage, uh, as most of them originally were in that area, and, and many places, Higgins Beach and, and some in Pine Point, et cetera, over the decades. Uh, this house itself is over 120 years old. Uh, it was built as a seasonal structure along with a uh, horse barn and, and hayloft in the back. Uh, that's again how old these were. Most of the houses in this particular area, um, even those that are built on uh, significantly larger lots or even just marginally larger lots, uh, had all the houses uh, at the time. They were built right up front with the, the barns, uh, the carriage houses, what have you, that are in the back, similar to what you see on the, the plan that Brian has shown. Um, and uh, in this particular situation, actually, we've got a house that, with eaves included, the front, there is no front setback. Uh, it actually, eave actually extends about three inches over the front property line. So we've called it at 0, 0.0, um, but the eave, again, is actually in the public right-of-way. Um, and then the, uh, the house, as you can see it as well, uh, uh, on the left side, as you're oriented uh, looking at this document, is exceptionally close to uh, the uh, lot on the left, which is the, um, it got the garage for the abutter and then the, the horse barn in the back or the old barn in the back and then the, uh, the house on the right side, you can see that's a full house that as well is, is uh, very close to the common property line. Most of the houses that were out there, primarily because of the size of the lots and to be able to get what were that time, the carriages to be able to get back to the respective barns, were built to one side of the property. So instead of being in the middle as they have been uh, uh, required to be over the past several decades, most of these houses uh, took advantage of being very close to the property line on one side, leaving a little bit of room for the horses and then the carriages and then later the automobiles to be able to uh, access uh, the drives. Um, what we have uh, again is a, uh, a house that, or a structure that is um, zero feet from the front. Uh, the left side is one half foot. On the right side, it's five feet, and in the rear, uh, given the barn, it's 3.8 feet. Uh, the approximate lot coverage, the way you saw it on the plan, is 39%. What we're looking to do is to significantly um, reduce the nonconformity on this lot. We would actually uh, request that the existing house, the plans of which are in your packets, uh, would be five feet from the front, six from the left side, 12 feet from the southerly side, the right side, um, and then 13 feet from the rear, again, uh, substantially reducing the nonconformities that are out there. Uh, as you know, with a um, with a hardship variance, there are four principal criteria, uh, the first of which is almost always the, uh, the, the most interesting to go through, and that is reasonable return. Can the property uh, allow or, or have a reasonable return if the variance is not granted? In this particular case, and that's always a, basically a subjective uh, determination, in this particular case, it's relatively easy to be able to make that argument because this house at 120 years old, it's, it's not going to fall down if you lean on it, but it's getting to the point where it doesn't really have much of a shelf life left. 
uh, during the inspection, there was mold in the, in the property. Uh, the stairways are significantly steeper and, and uh, narrower than building safety codes would allow by today's standards. Uh, everything about the new structure that uh, uh, Mr. Hillis has had design improves the overall safety quality of the house and the, the character of the neighborhood. But before we get into that, again, uh, can the house yield a reasonable return? The answer to that question would be basically an emphatic no. Um, because this is past its shelf life. As many of the houses, although a lot of the houses in that area have been redone recently, uh, many of the houses that are on larger lots didn't need variances at all. Some of them did. Um, some of them that are not in the, uh, the flood zone, and, and the flood zone occupies or, or takes up the majority of these properties uh, in that particular area, but there are some that aren't, uh, and those houses have been redone. So uh, the, the reasonable return for those houses is pretty well guaranteed. In this particular case, this house is, is so old that uh, it's really past its life. And uh, you go too much longer, meaning you know months to years, a couple of years, and this house is gonna degrade to the point where um, there's actually safety concerns being able to live in there. People have known that over the years. Um, it's not a surprise to anyone. Most of the people in the Prouts Neck area have tried to keep their houses aesthetically pleasing, and most have done so. A couple of exceptions, but most of them are pretty nice. Um, some of the photographs that Brian is showing you right now are, are views of the house on the Locust and then down the lane. Um, and uh, it's just, uh, it, it's trying to aesthetically uh, improve or a house that uh, really needs to come down because in a very short time, uh, it's gonna come down on its own anyway. Uh, so it really needs to be rebuilt. And, and uh, if the variance is not granted, uh, then when this house does degrade to the point where it's really a safety hazard and starts collapsing, then uh, there's really no value to the property whatsoever if a house can't be rebuilt on it. Uh, the existing house, or the, the house that's proposed is actually in almost the exact same footprint. It's one foot longer than the house that you see there now, but it's the same width. Uh, we're also proposing to get rid of the barn that's in the back. Uh, it's not really, uh, it doesn't serve much of a purpose. That's really falling down. Um, you wouldn't park a car in it. And it's got the old loft. You can see where the old horses, the horses used to be there, et cetera. So uh, in this regard, um, the Hillises are proposing to just have their house and uh, thereby reduce the nonconformity as far as lot percentage, again, from 39% from, uh, to 29.5%. Um, uh, so significantly, everything goes in the right direction, in other words, as far as that's concerned. Um, so uh, as far as the reasonable return with only a 380 square foot building envelope, it gets kind of tough to be able to do anything in that lot if a variance is not granted uh, at some point whenever. Uh, the lot in question, uh, well, um, I'd like to move, just keep on going down the list as it were, uh, talking about the lot in question um, being created in 1900. The variance is due to unique circumstances. I'll be able to happy to read that into the record when we get to that point. Uh, but it is not a situation that was created by Mr. Hillis or any of the previous uh, the predecessors going all the way back to the time of the, the construction of the house because zoning came, was enacted many, many decades after the house was actually built. Uh, it will, the granting of the variance will significantly improve the neighborhood and the character of the neighborhood. One of Brian's comments uh, very apropos was uh, the board wants to take a look to make sure that the new structure would not be out of character. Uh, with the houses that are in the neighborhood. And toward that end, Mr. Chairman, if you have no objection, I've got some recent photographs of some other houses that are on the same road, uh, Sacarapa Lane and then Garrison Lane, which is immediately behind it, uh, that faces this house as well. And I'd like to be able to just pass these out to you just so you can take a quick look at, at some of the houses that would uh, um, show that the character is really oh, actually wow, gonna be enhanced. Thank you. And how far away are these houses from the property in question? Uh, the property in question, when you take a look at the taps, tax map, um, the, the property is actually, uh, um, it's toward the bend in the road when you look down Sacarapa. Uh, we actually had it highlighted, but the highlight didn't show up in the copies that we made, but uh, it's a lot number, I think it's 44. Um, and uh, the answer to your question is, these are in the immediate vicinity of this house. Some are a little around the corner, um, but they're all on Sacarapa. And then uh, the latter two of the um, packets that I gave to you are houses that are on Garrison. It's right behind this house. 
Um, so not immediately behind it, but um, there's actually a, uh, a couple of houses that have been, you can, let's put it this way, you can see this house from all these other houses. The point being is that uh, while the new house is going to be fully compliant with all building codes and fire safety codes, et cetera, um, it's also going to enhance the character just because it's brand new in any case, but it also fits in with the character of the neighborhood given the houses, some of which you can see there. I didn't bother to take the, uh, the pictures of all of them, but uh, these are some of those that are uh, substantially larger in many cases, um, as high or higher um, than the proposed use. And um, you know, they're all in the floodplain. This house is also being elevated above that floodplain um, so that uh, there's no issue in the future going forward as far as FEMA is concerned. And then finally, the, the hardship is, is due solely to the enactment of zoning over the years. It's, it's not the uh, uh, course of any action taken by the appellant. With that, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the board, I'd be happy to address any comments or answer any questions that you have. Yeah, one question I have um, on sheet A4-1, I see a proposed roof height at 37.1 feet. But then I see a max roof height at 42.39 feet, but then actually the house goes beyond that dimension line. What's yep. the actual real height from to the, to the top of this building from grade? Um, from grade, it, uh, on the, uh, if you're looking at A43, um, there should be the, uh, I can't really read this, it's my, so, my copy is so small, but uh, suffice it to say that when the architects designed this house, um, they did so, and as you're probably aware, um, the, uh, the distance that is basically a non-habitable area on a pitched roof that is between the uh, highest eave and the peak um, is the half of that distance. You can actually have a house that is, or structure that is higher than the 35 feet, which is the maximum that's allowed uh, for the habitability portion of that. Uh, and the architects, based on that design, they have to comply, with, and they know this, they have to comply to make sure that this house is no higher than 35 feet. That includes, that's from grade, um, the, the lowest grade that actually um, goes up to where the first finished floor is above the floodplain. So it's not like you've got a 30 foot high actual, or 35 foot high actual structure or higher than that. Um, well, you do, but uh, the first finished floor doesn't actually start until you're well above grade to accommodate for the flood hazard. So Here. while this is a three-story house, it's they're sort of sort of short stories, as it were, because of that uh, uh, elevation above the floodplain. So you're presuming that the your your assumption is that the the total height, the 35 foot height limit, it starts at the floor elevation and it ends at the ceiling elevation. No, it starts at the actual grade. Yep. Um, and goes up to the halfway of the distance, and Brian, please correct me if I'm, if I'm not wrong, goes up to halfway the distance between the highest eave and the peak. I guess, Mr. Chair. Yes, please. If, if the building isn't in the shoreland zone, which this one isn't, normal zoning says that you take the average grade at the front of the house and you measure, you're allowed to have 35 feet as measured between the, the midpoint between the eave and the peak of the roof. Okay. So what Mr. Fisher is trying to say, or is, is, is saying, is, is that it's possible that the peak is higher than 35 feet, as long as that midpoint between eave and peak is not higher than 35. Okay. Thank you. The other, the other issue would be that we also have a requirement that if you're closer than 15, or if your house is more than 30 feet tall, you have to have a setback to the side and rear property line that is at least 50% of the height of the structure. So at 35 feet, you'd need to be 17 and a half feet from the property line, which this, this house clearly isn't on one side, um, but that would be part of the Part of the request, I would guess, for relief. Yes. Um, the applicant didn't really indicate what that is. Um, the, the dimension that we're sh we're seeing here is 29 feet 11 and a quarter. It's not 30. <laughs> it's right. It's doggone close. Right. Um, okay. Go ahead, Ms. Stevenson. Do you know approximately how much taller this building is going to be than the existing building? 
than the existing building. Yeah. Um, there is that information is in your packet. I don't have that off the top of my head, but uh, there is some information about the existing structure and the elevations that are shown toward that end. Um, to answer your question specifically, it will be higher to yep. be sure, um, but not not that much higher. In the uh, existing elevations, there's a 19 foot two inch height from finished okay. floor. From finished floor. Um, but yeah, so I wasn't that. sure about is that also considered the that's not considered the grade. I was just wondering. I, yeah, I mean, I, uh, we've got apples and oranges here. Okay. <laughs> It is, it, uh, is, it is tall. There's no engineer in the sure. world that'll give you all the information that you require, I've found. <laughs> <laughs> so but yeah, you can guess that. It's probably about another, I'm guessing about three, three and a half to four feet from finished floor to grade. Okay. Something like that. Yes. Four feet. So if you added four feet to 19, you're around 23. 23 and change. Other questions or comments from the board? Rudy? Pardon me, Mr. Chair. Uh, when was or uh, the last time that the residence was in, in use, uh, whether or not um, the applicant or um, others? Uh, it was about two, year, two years ago is, is the, the basic question or the basic answer to the question. Um, but it was used as a temporary residence. So uh, honestly, how, when the predecessor owned it, I really don't know how often they actually stayed there. Okay. Many of the houses in the Proudsneck area are summer residences yeah. and they're occupied a few times, a few months during the year at most. Um, this will be built as a full-time residence. All right, and the past two years since it was purchased, has it been occupied? Uh, you've been living in it for you know the temporary times that you've been up here, yes. Okay, thank you. Any other questions we want to ask at this point? <coughs> Mr. Silk? The 12-foot elevation of the floor, is that what the foot plane requires here, 12 feet? Um, the way the architect did this is to, uh, they started at actually mean sea level, so it's sort of a misnomer when you're ready. Let's put it this way. From a, is that 12 feet above mean sea level? Yes. So that is the It's the, well, that's, you've got the, the new floodplain requirement and then typically the finished floor has to be a one foot above that, one point or, or greater above that. So yes, it meets that criteria as far as flood hazard is concerned. Mr. Chair. Yes. So, so Mr. Fisher, in other words, you've designed this to meet the, the new maps rather than the current maps. Yes. Any other comments from the board? Okay, excellent. Uh, Mr. Fisher, we'll go through each of the criteria here and you can just read your answers into the, into the record as we go. Um, excuse me, Mr. Longstaff, I've buried my application. <laughs> excuse me, folks, sorry. Do you want me to bring it up on the screen? Yes, please. I think after two years, I'd have a better you system of organizing the papers in front of me. Forgive me. <laughs> no, the answer is here we go. Thank you. The land in question cannot yield a reasonable return unless the variance is granted. Reasonable return does not mean maximum return. Applicant must demonstrate practical loss of virtually all reasonable use of land if the variance is not granted. Reasonable return is not determined by personal circumstances of the applicant. Uh, that is correct. The land in question cannot yield at least a reasonable return unless the variance is granted. The existing 120-year-old structure on the lot, uh, structures on the lot are structurally deficient. They do not meet any building safety codes or standards at all or the existing code. Uh, they do not show the present. They do show the presence of mold in the house, and there's an inspection report in your packet to show that. Uh, they have long passed the time when they should be replaced uh, with a house that is structurally and code compliant. The building envelope, uh, see the existing conditions plan, is only 380 square feet, uh, which could not support any structure much larger than a shed. 
without a variance to allow construction of a new house, uh, which would be less non-conforming than the existing structures on the house, on the lot, this lot would be essentially valueless. Okay. Number two, the need for a variance is due to the unique circumstances of the property. This criterion applies to property, not people, and to an uncommon condition not shared by the neighborhood. Correct. The lot in question was created circa 1900, and the variance is due to the unique circumstances of the property, it being only 50 feet wide and 74 feet deep. The lot and the structures on it were created long before any type of zoning was enacted in Scarborough. The incredibly small building envelope is due to the enactment of current zoning before which anybody could build a house or other structure anywhere on the lot without regard to setbacks or other restrictions. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Number three, the granting of the variance will not alter the essential character of the neighborhood. The granting of the variance will significantly improve the neighborhood in which the lot is located because the proposed structure will be less non-conforming in terms of setbacks from all four property lines. It will occupy considerably less land area. In other words, it will reduce the percentage of lot coverage and it will add to the aesthetic of the area by improving the look of the house and the property. There will be no detrimental effect to the essential character of the locality. Okay, thank you. And lastly, the hardship is not the result of action taken by the applicant or prior owner of the property. That is correct. The hardship is due solely to the enactment of zoning, uh, which occurred many decades after the lot was created and the structures on it were originally built. It is not the result of action taken by the uh, appellant or any prior owners. Okay, thank you. Any last questions from the board before we go into public comment? Mr. Bork? Yes. Uh, Mr. Uh, I'm sorry. Fisher. <laughs> Fisher. I, I, I had the previous one right in front of me. Yeah, I brought it down further below, so pardon me for that. Not at but, all. But um, uh, looking at uh, criterion number two, um, the lot in question was created circa 1900, and the variance is due to the unique circumstances of the property. Uh, could you tell us a little bit more about what makes this lot unique compared to the other lots in this neighborhood? Uh, I can tell you, I don't know why it was created the way it was, but as Brian had indicated no, not, earlier. Not why, but you know, is it different than all the other lots around it? Yes. Um, it is significantly smaller than most other lots uh, in that area. Uh, there are actually only two other lots in the immediate vicinity that are of similar size. All the other properties, while still significantly lesser than by the standards by creating a new lot today, there are a few lots that would meet, uh, it would pass muster today by current zoning. But other than that, um, these lots, of which this one is uh, an example of the smallest, were for whatever reason created over 120 years ago the size that they are. And that makes it unique in this particular area because all the other, the vast majority of the other houses and the lots on which they sit um, are substantially lo uh, larger than this particular one. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Yes, Mr. Mr. Karen? Chair. Sure. Um, taking a look at some of the photographs and some of the plans, um, not necessarily uh, related to the building itself, but the perimeter of the site mm -hmm. um, to the, what appears to be the right side of the plan. Uh, and on the um, boundary survey, it mentions some landscape timbers. Um, are those uh, um, items on your site or are they on the at Butters? Are you looking at that uh, small row of bushes and trees that are yeah. on that site? Um, mm -hmm. Basically both, but they are, the, the, the crown systems of those appear to be just off of this property. So they're not on yours, all right. That's correct. Um, and to the rear, there's a mention of a stockade fence. Is that still, uh, still erected? Or is there a fence to the rear of the property? There is a fence at the rear of the property, yes. All right. Um, has there been any thought of replacing or planting any additional vegetation um, at the perimeter of the, the property just for uh, the increased height of the building for uh, sight lines? Uh, for sight lines? Uh, well, there is an intent. This is one of the reasons why the Hillis has indicated that um, they wanted to take down and not replace the barn because they would like to be able to make that back area a combination of lawn and garden. Yeah. Um, just improve it to the extent that native species in Maine will grow with it, it, as well as they could. Um, and that's part of the reason why they didn't want that structure back there. As far as sight lines, so you mean sight lines as far as a, a continuity from property to property in the back of those properties. Yes, that's why they're not putting it back there. All right. Uh, all right. Thank you. You're welcome. I have a follow-up question. Um, from the structural integrity report, 
just with regard to the building, uh, the building's infrastructure here, it said that um, no calculations or physical testing were performed to determine the adequacy, adequacy of the complete structural systems. Um, they did indicate that it would be more efficient to remove the existing structure and reconstruct the building as new when compared to trying to correct the structural deficiencies in place during a renovation. Does they, do they provide any information of stating that it is incur currently in a failing state? Uh, we don't actually have the uh, like a physical report like you do in a commercial structure, um, which is you know if you're looking at spalled concrete or uh, flayed um, uh, wooden pillars, et cetera. Um, majority of these houses, just because of the much because of the salinity in the air um, and the uh, the degradation of the materials that are created there are of that caliber. So while we did ask the, the structural engineer to go through the house and take a look at it, which he did, um, this was the extent of his report saying from a residential perspective, you know, what more is there to say kind of thing. It's, it's the house is pretty much shot and just needs to be replaced. Gotcha. Okay. I mean, we could, you could probably say that for most of, or a lot of the houses in that Proud's Neck area that are still uh, resided in. Yes, Apparently. especially those that are more than a half century old or so. They just, <clears throat> and that's what you get when you build a house on the coast. And because most of these were built as cottages originally, I don't know for sure, but I would imagine that most people when they built them probably assumed that they'd be there longer than they would live ostensibly, but maybe 40 or 50 years. And, and this one is actually stretched out to 120. So, and others have as well. But they are, as Brian had mentioned, there's quite a number of uh, replacements that are in that area and there's going to be more um, as, the few houses that are left of this caliber need to be replaced. Gotcha. I guess the my, my trouble I'm having on this one is just trying to find, again, question one, the reasonable return. Um, reasonable return does not mean maximum return, and the applicant must demonstrate practical loss of virtually all reasonable use of the land if the variance is not granted. And some looking at the verbiage from the reports from the engineer, and I'm not seeing you know, I'm not seeing photos of crumbling foundation or anything like that. I don't see a failing structure in front of me. Granted, I understand that, you know, we all don't want to be living in a structure that's crumbling beneath our feet before we're forced to take action at that point. Um, but I'm, I'm just a little bit torn on this one. Um, can you provide me a little bit more info as far as has there been an analysis of, um, you know, uh, what's the remaining, you know, it's, we keep saying it's, it's, it's at the end of a shelf life and every house has that, has that curve where you just can't stick any more money into it anymore, but has there been a, uh, an estimation of how much time is left in this structure before we start seeing some real failed systems? Um, that's very, very subjective sure. um, because it really depends on the, the use, the extent of the use of a particular structure. Um, if somebody uses a house for three weeks out of the year as opposed to 12 months, then the wear and tear on the house is probably not going to be quite as great. On the other hand, um, any house is going to be aged, no matter what its material is going to be aging over the years. There is a report that's part of your packet um, that was from the home inspection that's uh, indicated that there are quite a number of deficiencies, um, and uh, including mold that's in the house. It, and as we're probably aware, once you get mold in a house, I mean, unless it occurs in a little tiny corner or something like that where you can bleach it out of there, that just takes off in the walls and now you're, you've really got a, a significant issue. The builder, the Knickerbocker Group, also did a, an inspection of this property and it also indicated, um, albeit in writing, um, that, uh, and that's part of your uh, report as well, that there are substantial problems in trying to maintain this house any further, that it really does need to be rebuilt. Um, otherwise, it's just going to again, eventually and sooner than later fall apart around us. Okay. Any other comments or questions from the board? Mr. Bork? Yes, regarding uh, the, uh, this, this, this location of the lot, uh, it's in a hazard area. Could you explain a little bit more to us exactly what that means? You mean a flood hazard area? Um, that typically means that uh, in, a, in, a, in a significant rain event um, or storm event, you've got the potential to be able to have substantial flooding in an area that doesn't otherwise naturally lend itself to flooding. In other words, um, on a daily basis, you're not, it's not really uh, in a hazard for 
um, uh, imminent flooding. But as soon as you get a, a substantial storm event, uh, i.e. a hurricane or something that is a little bit less than that, but is still causing a lot of storm action, wave action, hydraulic action, in other words, from the waves, and this isn't that far from the coast, um, any of those storm waves could actually breach the dunes that are out there. And once those dunes are breached, that water doesn't really have anywhere to go, um, hence the dunes. There's a continued um, accretion of sand by tidal actions that creates dunes throughout the area. And uh, once those dunes get, and normally when you have storm tides that go up against those dunes and the tidal action falls straight back and the dunes actually act as a protectant. Um, however, in significant storm events, when you've got water that breaches over the top of those dunes, it's essentially got nowhere to go but to continue to go landward because it can't get back over the, the, uh, uh, the dune on its own. So then it tends to uh, flood the areas in which the, uh, the, the lower areas on the land side of the dunes. That's the particular area in which this is located. There's a flood map that's a part of your packets as well that will show you the extent of what the, the flood range could be in that area. It's not saying it would be, but it could be. Fortunately, in this area, um, while there's rock everywhere and a good portion of, of the actual Prout's um, Island or Prout's Isthmus is rock, this particular area is a lot of sand. So when you do get flooding, um, the flood the hazards, uh, instead of going in what's euphemistically referred to as a kettle, um, where the water goes in there and sits there for, in some cases, for days long after a storm goes by, waiting for that saturation of soil to be able to take care of that uh, flood hazard, most of this area is sand, so it's relatively permeable, but it's still a flood hazard. And the danger is in, uh, from FEMA's perspective, is the hydraulic action of the waves on the surface. It's, it's not water coming up from below, or it's not storm water as much as it is that danger of uh, wave action that uh, needs to have the free movement of wind, sand, and water beneath the structure so that the water comes at it in one direction and can keep on going. So just as a follow-up to that, uh, would this particular existing structure be particularly vulnerable in the case of such an event? No, uh, no it is now. Um, as is many of the That's structures that are out there, but, uh, but it won't be in the future. Um, you know, shy of a direct hit by a hurricane, in which case we've all got a lot more problems to deal with, but uh, other than that, um, it is designed to be high enough so that, uh, elevated high enough so that the first finished floor, the habitable areas, are a foot above that floodplain. What I meant is comparing the existing structure to what's proposed, elevated, Okay, what's, what does that mean in, in the case of a catastrophic event like that? Um, it means that the, uh, the subgrade structure, uh, the support system basically, the foundation, even though there's not an actual foundation, um, would be uh, uh, considerably elevating. Well, first of all, it's going to be new. So it's going to be based on standards that are in place today as opposed to no standards that were in place as far as building codes are concerned that were in place at the time that this was built. Uh, you've probably seen some examples where some houses, albeit not this one, is actually built on tree trunks um, for support. And while great at the time for a cottage that nobody really ex expected to last more than a few decades, you've got some of these very substandard support systems that are just are ready to collapse. And when that happens, even if the house above it has been you know, relatively well maintained, if your structural support is detrimental to the uh, uh, holding the house up, then as soon as one of those things goes, the entire house can actually collapse. So from a flood perspective, by today's standards and building codes, um, and this is what has to be supplied to Brian as far as the review is concerned before the, the building permit is issued, that everything has to meet current code based on that structural integrity. Thank you for your explanation. What Mr. Hillis was just mentioning is that the, the, the foundation support systems right now are on cinder blocks. Um, and the new ones will actually be on piers. Cinder blocks too, by the way, and we've probably seen that, are particularly susceptible to salinity. They tend to, to uh, um, it's called spalling, uh, much more frequently and uh, more often than uh, even wooden pile structures. Mr. Chair, just, just for a little context, what I have on the screen here right now is the, is the <coughs> preliminary new FEMA maps that are not currently effective, but will be, we expect, next year. The red and black line that you see, it goes right through the eastern um, boundary line and, and it's part of the existing uh, barn or shed on, on uh, 14 Sakurapa. 
That's called the limit of moderate wave action, or LIMWA is the new terminology. And what that is, is it, it, it denotes the, or, or, or delineates the, the line between where wave action from a storm event would be between one and three feet of inundation. And so you can see right at that property line, anything east of that line would have to be on piers, posts, or pilings. It could not be a conventional foundation. Anything left or west of that line could be a, a crawl space or a conventional foundation, not a full basement, but could be on a conventional, wouldn't have to be on post piers or pilings. And so the design that they've proposed is, is kind of belts and suspenders, and they're that close, so they're, they're, they're putting in a post piers and pilings. And, and I think the majority of properties down there are doing that unless they're another two or three parcels away from this line. Just, but just to show you how close they are, to, to your point, Mr. Bork, that would be a, a, an inundation event where wave action overlapping waves could, could reach one to three feet. It's no longer velocity zone. It's not getting the full force of, of wave action from a storm event, but it's that over splashing and then an inundation of one to three feet beyond that line or west of that line, there's not that, that probability. It's still in the floodplain, but it's not in a, in, a, in a storm event type situation where wave action is going to uh, create the problem. Thank you. Pardon me, Mr. Chair. Yes. Uh, just another question, if you would mind. Um, and I apologize uh, as I'm getting a bit um, mistaken. but. I seem to recall this evening or reading as I reviewed the application that um, the reason why you're seeking the certain variance you are tonight is a bit different than uh, what you uh, what may have been intended or a different type of variance. Is that correct? Uh, just pointing out that it, normally a house in a situation like this, were it not in the floodplain, would not be uh, required to have a hardship variance. It would be a practical difficulty. Okay. But uh, in this particular case, because it is in the floodplain, it meaning any of the houses in this area automatically have to go for a hardship variance. All right, thank you. Great. I do have a question too. I go ahead. I'm not sure it's still anything in there, but um, it says in the inspection, possible mold found in the basement at the time of the inspection. Do you have, sorry, do you have a report? Um, the, is there a report of the, did you get that? further inspected by a mold company? Um, um, that was the company, home inspection company. There's actually a, I don't know if that's what you're reading, but uh, there is a, a portion of that report um, that deals with everything from doors tested, and windows and grass. Yes, that's it. Okay. Um, is, is it, did they deem that they can't eradicate the mold? Uh, they don't do that. Okay. Um, they just say, if you're doing an inspection for anybody who's purchasing a property saying, you know, beware, there's mold here. It yeah. uh, doesn't prevent anybody from doing it. They certainly make suggestions that you might want to have it removed, but um, they're not the ones that say definitely remove this or just pointing it out. Okay. I was just trying to claim if, uh, I guess, help out with one of the four criteria. If, if it, uh, you know, can't be removed, then that could be an indication that you would need to start over. <laughs> anything can happen or anything can be done basically, but it gets to a point where, um, and just having done this for three decades, once you get mold, it's, it's and you know, unless it's very visible, um, like in a, on a floor corner or something like that, where you can typically, you know, throw some bleach at it and take care of it. Most of the mold gets into the damp areas in the walls or underneath where you don't really see it. <clears throat> Excuse me. And trying to eradicate that once that takes hold is very challenging. Um, and that's one of the reasons when Knickerbocker went in there and took a look at it, uh, because originally it was like, what can we do with this house to be able to improve it? And they basically said, it's, you really have to get rid of this house. It's long past its viable life, and there's a lot of reasons why. And it would be actually less expensive, and they've got that uh, criteria in the packet as well, to redo the home as Mr. Ellis has had it designed than it would be to try to you know, put lipstick on the, uh, the animal, as it were. Any other questions? Mr. Longstaff, we received uh, any emails, letters, phone calls regarding this application? No, Mr. Chair, I did not receive any written communications on this. Okay, I'll open the floor for any public hearing. If anybody would like to speak. 
You absolutely may. Just come right up to the podium and state your name and uh, your address for the record. Tall people around here. My name is Ann Butterfield. I live on Three Prospector Lane in Scarborough. I've lived there full time for about two and a half years, two, two years. Um, I'm a uh, fifth generation Proud Snack resident. I live on 21 and 24 Sacarapa Lane. Um, on a beach cottage with its um, rear, like, granny cottage, which we call the bungalow. Um, the bungalow that we have is roughly 70 feet away from Roger and Lisa's house. And um, I didn't expect to come and talk today. I expected to come and listen and see how this process works because my family will need to figure out if we're going to rebuild our 112-year-old cottage on the beach. And um, so I have two points. One is... Unless an old cottage is supremely well built at the beginning, once it gets past about 100, you're wondering, what do we do next? Because the maintenance does become formidable, and at a certain point you wonder, is this futile? There will be peculiarities of quote-unquote architecture, <laughs> in other words, design done on the spot, that um, eventually becomes, you know, we can't fix this. For example, in my 112-year-old cottage, we have a staircase that has a clearance of about five foot ten. <laughs> so all the men are like this going downstairs. Um, so that's our story. Uh, you know, as a 60-year-old who's grown up in Prouts, and my grandmother grew up in Prouts, my great-grandmother grew up in Prouts, I've seen a lot of the old houses. Some of them are fabulous. Many of them are fabulous, even the non-conforming weirdos, and we love them all. But there's an end of life to even these grand old houses that are the funkies. Now, I live really close to, of course, this row right here. Um, these, I call these the old fishing cottages, for lack of a more accurate term. And, um, you know, they're variously built. Um, this particular one that the Olsons, the Hillas Olsons have, um, has been spruced up by the prior owner. Um, it's, I've been in it. It's got some very uncomfortable angles in there. I saw a sagging ceiling in there. Um, love the people. The house is like, <laughs> it's a good idea to move along. I can say aesthetically, their drawings make my heart sing. I think they would re really good on the shingle style architecture with the grand gable and the good dormers, um, multiple sizes of windows, the shingles. Um, makes, it just makes me happy what they're intending to do. And um, I have to own my bias. I, I, I am friends with them, which is part of the reason I knew this was happening. So um, there's that. Um, I'm just very pleased. I think their plan is rational sensible, practical, a benefit to the neighborhood. And, um, you know, it's a house that can withstand more severe storms, which is part of the equation, I think, in today's uh, do we rebuild world. So um, is this helpful? And if you have any questions about Prowse, I'm right here. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. really appreciate it. Yeah. OK. Any other comments? I'll, I'll mention she has a really nice dog, too. <laughs> Put them the findings of fact. Uh, okay, seeing no other comments, we'll close the public um, public forum of the hearing. Jim, we're all set with you for right now. We're going to deliberate internally here. Thank you. Uh, but if we have any questions, we'll we'll uh, we'll call you back up. Uh, so what we're going to do again, going through the board, we'll go through the four criteria that's here. <clears throat> Similar to before, read our answers into the record, and we'll go vote up and down. Before we get started, are there any comments? Anything people want to talk about? Any questions we want to ask the board members or Mr. Longstaff? Yes, Rudy. Um, I'd just like to say, and generally, um, having reviewed some previous applications, not those tonight, I know there's not a precedent, but I would say in the past I have seen a little bit more um, concrete or refined surveys or analysis or cost estimates to help uh, with some of the justification. Uh, so uh, in general, should anyone else be uh, planning on similar uh, actions in the future, uh, that goes a long ways, that's all. I agree, I, I don't, uh, I'm not taking away from the fact that this building certainly needs to be replaced. Um, but a lot of times in applications, we wanna see a little bit more detail as far as a report, some kind of uh, a little bit, 
a report that's a little bit further in depth with an actual dollar value assigned to it or an actual remediation value associated with it rather than just, uh, you know, it, we don't really know how deep the mold is until you have a study done and you do some hard demolition, selective demolition, you go in and take a look behind of a wall and to really document and see the extent of that damage. Um, but we have the information here that we have to go on and it's very well, this could be spread throughout the entire house without us even knowing. But we have to take on uh, into account the statements by the applicants tonight and the information here that's in the application and nothing else uh, that's, you know, could be um, creatively floating around in our heads right now. It just has to be what they've stated and the information that's in the application. Um, so that being said, if there are any other comments, we'll go right into number one. Uh, the hardest one, uh, the land in question cannot yield a reasonable return unless the variance is granted. Reasonable return does not mean maximum return. The applicant must demonstrate practical loss of virtually all reasonable use of land if the variance is not granted. Reasonable return is not determined by personal circumstances of the applicant. And I'll start with you, Mr. Karen, excuse me. Uh, all right, thank you. Um, I believe this one is, uh, well, I should say all of these are a bit difficult due to the circumstances, as mentioned. Uh, I question about the type of variance that are before us tonight and why it might be different due to the floodland zone uh, and setbacks. Um, I would say that the uh, there's a little bit of um, difference in interpretations be uh, between what was presented with the reports and the possibility of certain aspects and. Um, what was uh, stated or included within the application itself. Um, I don't, I'm in agreement of building or structure of this age um, uh, and with the upcoming changes um, to the community uh, could certainly benefit um, uh, from a replacement uh, rather than additional monies into it. Um, Safety, life, uh, um, building codes uh, certainly have changed over the past 120 years. Um, certain aspects could be grandfathered in, um, but uh, nowadays, uh, and to continue to keep this around for another 120 um, uh, interventions would be necessary um, for full use of the property. Um, I think that's all I can really say to this one. Okay. Mr. Silkman? <clears throat> it strikes me that this is only a matter of time. I mean, if they aren't here this year, then they'll be here next year or the year after. But certainly there's been at least a couple of our tenures on this board. It's, it's the building is that dilapidated and it's going to have to be dealt with one way or another. The concept of a reasonable return, I don't think was designed to reflect the ability to use a piece of property for three weeks of the year. I mean, for some, that might be why you would build a piece of property, but I don't think that's the underlying concept of what a reasonable return means to a house. I think a reasonable return has to be in the context of being able to use it as a year round. And that's why they have housing. <clears throat> if you can't use it as a year round property, then it seems to me that it's really not giving you a reasonable return. And so, therefore, I think. <clears throat> that uh, <clears throat> the application satisfies its first condition. I don't think the house as it stands can provide a reasonable return. Even if we somehow could get around that, they are got to be back in a year or two. Why force people to wait one year, two years, three years until it falls down around it and others will just start to vote now and do it. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Bork. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I think if we look at the allowable footprint uh, for development on this property it is so tiny that all we would possibly fit in here is a, a shed, which is certainly not livable. Uh, and, um, you know, the, that's, I think, to me, that's a, that's a <clears throat> very important thing to look at. I know that's covered in one of the in more detail in one of the upcoming ones. But I'd like to just start by saying that, that there really isn't anything you can do with this property unless we you, you know, grant a variance. Uh, and that's, that really meets this criterion right up front. Uh, secondly, I think the uh, applicant has provided us with enough information from reputable uh, sources, uh, and even though numbers weren't provided, uh, which would have been nice, 
um, I think that if you look at the, you know, the, the people who did this, uh, Barnes, uh, Vans Architects, the Knickerbocker Group, which I'm very familiar with, and they're a top-notch outfit, um, and structural inte integrity, uh, these, uh, these are all highly reputable firms that are basically saying this is not a habitable structure. Uh, it really has no use, at, uh, practically. Um, and the only reasonable thing to do is to build something new. Uh, given that, you know, I think that really, you know, gives us the opportunity to say, okay, what, what would make sense to be on this property and then to proceed through the other uh, parts of this uh, application. But I think the applicant has provided enough information to satisfy the first criterion, in my opinion. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Stevenson? Uh, I agree with Mr. Bork. Um, the only part that I'm struggling with a little bit is to demonstrate loss of virtually all reasonable use of the land, but I think that you guys came up with a, a pretty reasonable, um, you know, explanation of what it means to meet criteria for number one more than it doesn't, so I'm that's all I have to say about that. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, it's been stated through the, the various uh, experts that submitted information as part of the application that we've reviewed. Um, the structure's past its useful life. I didn't see anything in there that was directly failing. However, again, uh, per my re previous comment, just because a building isn't failing now doesn't mean it could be failing tomorrow. Um, Mold can be remediated. I would like to have seen more documentation of how widespread this was. Similarly, with steep stairwells, an investigation or at least a, a statement stating that steep stairwells that are not code compliant inside of the house could be rebuilt, I would like to have seen. Um, or at least a cost associated with that as well. Uh, similarly, uh, with the foundation, it would have been nice to see just some photo documentation just showing the current state of the structure uh, to give more of that evidence of there's no real reasonable return here because the structure, even though the experts here may not indeed see it as uh, stated as failing right now today, you're seeing more detailed um, photographs of it actually failing to the, uh, the folks here on the board. So I don't mean to ramble like that. However, ultimately, um, looking at this, the, um, you, we do have uh, expert testimony from uh, licensed professional engineers and surveyors that have uh, submitted documentation saying that the building should be re replaced. And um, again, speaking to a 100-year-plus structure, not all of those are meant to be uh, staying around forever. And certainly, as these buildings are, are gaining more uh, years, they need to be replaced sooner rather than later. Um, so I don't see any. Ultimately, I will support this one. Mr. Longstaff? Yeah, I, I would just offer to the board, um, some good points have been made, um, both on the board and from the audience. The, this whole idea of reasonable return, to Mr. Sultman's point, the court case law has actually said, if you can put a picnic table on your lot and have a picnic, you're getting some return. From that. That's how case law has looked at it. Yeah, so, so case law <clears throat> has really looked at this very strictly. But the reality is, I, I'd like to, I, I always like to look at it and say, what was, the, what was the original use of the property? It was for a dwelling. Whether it was a seasonal dwelling or a year-round dwelling, it was for a dwelling. And if you can't have a dwelling, then are, are you gonna punish someone who's, who has had a dwelling for 120 years <laughs> and not be able to put a replacement dwelling because this one needs to be fixed. And it's, you know, so, so it's a really hard test and it's, it's really difficult for the board and it's difficult for the applicants. Totally agree with the statements being made, not to be harsh, but there could have been a lot more proof, could have been a lot more numbers, a lot more costs, a lot more comparisons, a yeah. lot more photographs of the failing structure. You know, things that would, the board wants the applicant to give us the reason or give you the reason, not me, I don't have a vote, give you the reason to say yes. The board would like to say yes. They need the supporting evidence to do that. This fell well, well short of that. 
I, I feel. But that's the board's determination. That's only my opinion. But again, going back, the reasonable return thing is that there was always a structure here. Well, at least for 120 years, there's been a structure here. So we, I think we can safely say always. And that's been the, the expected use of this property. Mm -hmm. So it would be unfair then to say, to take that strict court ruling and say, well, if the structure falls down, you can always go picnic on the lot. I don't think anybody wants to pay the kind of taxes that <laughs> I, I, you're, you're being paid. I agree, Brian. And, and the, the applicants have stated tonight that yeah. they're looking to live here. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they haven't stated onto the record that they're, you know, they're, exactly. they're looking to replace the property and, and then just immediately sell it afterwards. Right. You know, they're looking so I just to wanted to point out the difficulty in that and reinforce, to your point, the more evidence that can, can help us get there, the, the, the easier it is to come to that decision. You might, you might get there anyway, but um, it, it's, it's tough. The whole reasonable return thing is a very, very tough criteria. And, and just to clarify, in case anyone was wondering, and Mr. Karen asked the question, statutorily, main statute says that if you are in the floodplain or in the shoreland zone, you cannot, you cannot use the practical difficulty variance. So you have to go to this hardship variance, right. which I try to, at all costs, <clears throat> try to steer people away from because it is so difficult to meet that test. Mm -hmm. I appreciate Thank that. You. So we'll go to our vote now. Mr. Karen? I'll vote aye. Mr. Silkman? Yes. Mr. Bork? Aye. Ms. Stevenson? I'm an aye. Uh, I will vote nay on this. This is 4 1. Uh, number two, the need for variance is due to the unique circumstance of the property. This criterion applies to property, not to people, into an un uncommon condition not shared by the neighborhood. Um, Mr. Sk Mr. Karen, excuse me. <laughs> uh, as Mr. Bork mentioned earlier, and we've seen this evening, the, the building footprint on the site due to the setbacks, um, uh, unreasonable based on uh, zoning restrictions uh, after the building was initially built 120 years ago. Um, and that is unique to the property. And as questioned by Mr. Bork, there's only a few in the uh, nearby neighborhood that are similar in such uh, tight restrictions. Um, it's not, no fault to the current or previous owner um, and uh, other conditions in the neighborhood. Mr. Silkman? Mr. Bork? Yes, I'll add that um, the need for this is <clears> due <throat> to the fact that uh, zoning was implemented after this property was built. Thank you. Ms. Stevenson? I have nothing to add. Great. Um, the only not thoughts that the lot was created long before the current zoning was in effect, and that's been proven, as was discussed tonight, throughout many of the different lots in there, some similar size, some smaller, some larger. So let's go down through a vote for this for criteria number two. Mr. Karen? Aye. Mr. Silkman? Yes. Mr. Bork? Yes. Uh, Ms. Stevenson? Yes. And I will vote aye as well. Number three, the granting of the variance will not alter the essential character of the neighborhood. Mr. Karen? Uh, I defer to some of the information and evidence that we received tonight, in addition to the additional photographs uh, presented and the testimony shared by uh, the public. Um, there are various types of architectural uh, elements and aesthetics in the area uh, and the community. Um, while this may not be, or the proposed um, elevations, exterior appearance may not be concurrent with the abutters, uh, there is precedent of it. Um, so um, its intent and use as a year-round residence um, is, uh, is similar to how other properties in the area have been used. Mr. Silkman? Thank you. Mr. Bork? Yes, I'll add that um, the changes proposed will make the building more compliant, and that's an important consideration for us. Uh, it will be set back further away from the front line, which is also uh, more in keeping with what the character should be. 
Uh, it's a very attractive building, and um, as, as you know, we've heard from uh, you know, a member of the audience, and I think that um, it's going to look very nice in the neighborhood, no doubt. Ms. Stevenson? Yeah, uh, I just would add that um, in terms of the large open space, while the lot is small, if you're going to knock down that um, barn in the back, I think that's going to open that up a little bit, a little bit more. And um, I agree, Mr. Stutzman, uh, the design is beautiful. Great. Um, I'll mimic uh, those uh, with the public comment from Ms. Butterfield regarding the, uh, the architectural features of the property and his support of, uh, and her support as a neighbor of an adjacent property, owner of adjacent property, that it would fit the essential character of the neighborhood. Um, I'll, I'll admit, initially, when I was reviewing the packet and the photos, um, the photos provided in the street view of the house immediately adjacent, I wasn't necessarily in agreement with just the mass of the structure, two and a half stories, compared to its, uh, the initial existing structure. Um, and again, going back to maximum return, but uh, seeing that the other photos that you presented tonight, thank you for that, Jim. Um, next time, with, with the packet, please. Uh, but seeing the other photos of the larger structures that are similar mass in that area do help for providing um, um, uh, providing evidence for these structures that are there that are nearby and is not uh, sort of a um, not a distinguishing feature that doesn't match with the neighborhood. It does so. Uh, all those in favor of this one, Mr. Karen, aye. Mr. Silkman, yes. Mr. Bork, aye. Ms. Stevenson, aye. And I will vote aye as well. Uh, the hardship is not the result of action taken by the applicant or a prior owner of the property. The hardship must be caused by imposition by zoning restriction, not by action taken by the property owner. Mr. Karen. I think I may have already spoken to this concern, but um, the issue and the reason why they're here tonight is due to the zoning um, imposed after the original um, structure was built. Um, once again, not to uh, due to the current or prior owner. Mr. Silkman? I have nothing to add. Mr. Bork? Nothing to add. Ms. Stevenson? Nothing to add. Uh, agreed, yeah, the, uh, the owner wasn't here when the, none of us were here when the property was initially built and the size and construction and layout of the lots was certainly beyond and before any kind of zoning um, ordinances were imposed. Mr. Uh, Mr. Karen, your vote in number four, for number four, excuse me. Aye. Mr. Silkman? Yes. Mr. Bork? Aye. Ms. Stevenson? Aye. And I vote aye as well. Uh, so right now I will entertain a motion to approve appeal number 2726 as presented. Mr. Bork? Uh, so moved. And is there a second? I'll go with Ms. Stevenson for the second. I heard her first. <laughs> um, any comments? Discussion? Okay, seeing none. Mr. Karen? Aye. Mr. Silkman? Yes. Mr. Bork? Aye. Ms. Stevenson? Aye. And I will vote nay. So that's 4-1. And the application passes. Congrats. Um, lastly on our agenda, we have zoning board comments. Mr. Longstaff, do you have any comments for us? Uh, the only comment I have um, is that a uh, uh, couple of Personnel issues, um, you'll notice Doreen uh, Christ wasn't here tonight. She's uh, had a health issue. She'll be out for at least until um, early June. <clears throat> and our planning director, Jay Chase, has resigned his position and will be going to work for Central Maine Power. So we're going to be, CMP. staffing is going to be interesting this summer. <laughs> the dreaded CMP. Yeah. yeah. Maybe yeah. we'll get that uh, so. quarter built. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, so we, yeah, we, we certainly wish him well, and it's uh, yeah. you know he's he's done a great job for the town of Scarborough. Certainly miss him, yep. and uh, little by little, everybody that was here when I when I came here is leaving. So uh, <laughs> I don't know. I'm still here, Brian. You're yeah. <laughs> for better so, uh, for better for worse. That's that's really all I have, and uh, um, okay. uh, just a reminder that uh, we did decide uh, last month that in July we will do our meeting totally virtually. So yep. um, that won't affect us in June, but in yep. July. 
Uh, yep, yep. Going. Keep in mind, July we will be remote because of the room being taken and the uh, holiday week and all that. We wouldn't want to interrupt the vacation. And just on your earlier comment, we hope Doreen uh, gets better soon. We're all thinking about yes. it right now. Yep. Uh, any other comments, Ms. Uh, Stevenson? We may want to keep an eye on what's going on for COVID cases of in course. the June meeting, just yep. because I think the kids are masking again soon, right? Yeah. We'll, um, so I just wanted to put that on everyone's radar. I, I, pre I, I appreciate that. And I guess it... While I say that, maskless. <laughs> it's okay. At, at any point, any board member feels uncomfortable or just wants to voice an opinion or a question of, hey, should we have our meeting in person for the following month? You know, please do not hesitate. Email Brian and myself. Don't feel like you have to uh, ask here or ask, you know, and, and inquire can, to the entire board. We can poll the board at any time. With, yep. with your permission, we can poll yep. the board at any time, and we can do a hybrid meeting yep. if you deem it an emergency because yep. of the policy that you folks adopted. So. And 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 this is our this is this is our board that we're that we're managing here, and we're all in this you know we're we're all in this team together. So if anybody feels uncomfortable at any point, I would hope that you would just reach out to me, and we will make an, any uh, any accommodation. Uh, and if. You know, if the if the news uh, is reporting uh, case increases in a certain fashion, and there's a expressed concern about having the meeting in person, then we will absolutely go to a virtual meeting just for that month. So we'll, we'll let's keep an eye on it for next month. Stay tuned to your emails, um, and we'll we'll check on this. And if any if we do go virtual, it'll be posted on the uh, Scarborough Public website. But the date of, of the meeting itself will not be changed. It'll still be that second Wednesday. I would recommend that we, we uh, let Ms. Stevenson take the, take the lead on letting us know what the, what the uh, health situation is. She's I mean, she, yeah. Ms. Stevenson, yeah. does, is, you are the resident expert of all of us on this board with regard to that. So if, if, you, if you do feel you know, that it is... I it, just, who knows what it will look like in a couple more weeks. Yeah. So I just wanted to put that on the radar. But Absolutely. I, it's on everyone's radar. We all yeah. have to be thinking about it right now, 100%. I, I really appreciate you bringing it up. Else wants to do, so. Just one comment on that. Yep. Uh, yes, case counts are high, but if you look at what's going on as far as hospitalizations, there, there are two groups that are being hospitalized right now, and not too many of them are dying because they have the technology, they have the therapeutics in order to be able to deal with them. The two groups are older people with underlying conditions who have been vaccinated. The other group is younger people who have not been vaccinated. Mm. So it's important. You know, I think we've all been vaxxed, and I think we're all in good health. So it just, it just we can't just rely on case counts only. Agreed. I agree. It's There's a lot to take into it. It's not a single metric. That's why it's really not a... It's not an easy discussion or an easy choice to make. Uh, it's sort of a, you know, a, at the time, really a gut and a common sense call based on information that's out there. And I, I agree. With, I agree with you, Dave. You know, it's it's not that uh, it's not as severe as it was last year and, and the year before that. And, but, and then there are other, you know, ex circumstances as well for myself as a parent. If I get it, I'm most likely going to be fine. But now my children are going to be out from daycare for. 10 to 15 days just because of the close contact and all that. Mm -hmm. So there is a lot of mitigating factors going on and that's why I'm masked right now. But that being said, um, keep an eye on your email. Please reach out to Brian or I if you feel any kind of uncomfortable or uh, 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 uncomfortableness with meeting next month or if you have some information you'd like to share and uh, we'll make this decision together and uh, keep everybody in the loop. Cool. Uh, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Mr. Silkman, is there a second? I'll second. Rudy Karen is seconds. Okay. All those in favor? As unanimous. Meeting is adjourned.